Hello, thank you for joining me. We've been reading through A Course in Miracles, the main text, and today we're going to read from chapter 21, Reason and Perception, section eight, the last unanswered question. Do you not see that all your misery comes from the strange belief that you are powerless? Being helpless is the cost of sin. Helplessness is sin's condition, the one requirement that it demands to be believed. Only the helpless could believe in it. Enormity has no appeal to save the little. And only those who first believe that they are little could see attraction there. Treachery to the Son of God is the defense of those who do not identify with him. And you are for him or against him. Either you love him or attack him, protect his unity, or see him shattered and slain by your attack. No one believes the Son of God is powerless. And those who see themselves as helpless must believe that they are not the Son of God. What can they be except his enemy? And what can they do but envy him, his power, and by their envy make themselves afraid of it? These are the dark ones, silent and afraid, alone and not communicating, fearful the power of the Son of God will strike them dead and raising up their helplessness against him. They join the army of the powerless to wage their war of vengeance, bitterness and spite on him, to make him one with them, because they do not know that they are one with him. They know not whom they hate. They are indeed a sorry army, each one as likely to attack his brother or turn upon himself as to remember that they thought they had a common cause. Frantic and loud and strong, the dark ones seem to be, yet they know not their enemy except they hate him. In hatred they have come together, but have not joined each other, for had they done so, hatred would be impossible. Uh, let's just stop here for a second. In hatred they have come together, but not joined each other. We are one, but I, I, the images that keep coming to me are the capital steps on January 6th. It, those people came together, but they were not one. Yes, they were, you know, they were there for a, a what they thought was a united purpose. But had they really come together as one, when we are in oneness, there can't be any hatred. There can only be love. And so that's what this means here. For had they done so, hatred would be impossible. The army of the powerless must be disbanded in the presence of strength. Those who are strong are never treacherous because they have no need to dream of power and act out their dream. How would an army act in dreams any way at all? It could be seen attacking anyone with anything. Dreams have no reason in them. A flower turns into a poisoned spear, a child becomes a giant, and a mouse become, roars like a lion, and love is turned to hate as easily. This is no army, but a madhouse. What seems to be a planned attack is bedlam. The army of the powerless is weak indeed. It has no weapons, and it has no enemy. Yes, it can overrun the world and seek an enemy, but it can never find what is not there. Yes, it can dream it found an enemy, but this will shift even as it attacks so that it runs 
at once to find another and never comes to rest in victory. And as it runs, it turns against itself, thinking it caught a glimpse of the great enemy who always eludes its murderous attack by turning into something else. How treachery does this enemy appear, or how treacherous does this enemy appear who changes so it is impossible even to recognize him. Yet hate must have a target. There can be no faith in sin without an enemy. Who that believes in sin would dare believe he has no enemy? Could he admit that no one made him powerless? Reason could surely bid him seek no longer what is not there to find. Yet first he must be willing to perceive a world where it is not. It is not necessary that he understand how he can see it, nor should he try. For if he focuses on what he cannot understand, he will but emphasize his helplessness and let sin tell him that his enemy must be himself. But let him only ask himself these questions, which he must decide to have done for him. Do I desire a world I rule instead of a world that rules me? Do I desire a world where I am powerful instead of helpless? Do I desire a world in which I have no enemies and cannot sin? Do I, and do I want what I denied? Because, oh, I didn't do that one right. And do I want to see what I denied because it is the truth? You may have already answered the first three questions, but not yet the fourth, for this one still seems fearful and unlike the others. Yet reason would assure you that they are all the same. We said this year would emphasize the sameness of things that are the same. This final question, which is indeed the last you need decide, still seems to hold a threat the rest have lost for you. And this imagined difference attests to your belief that truth may be the enemy you yet may find. Here then would seem to be the last remaining hope of finding sin and not accepting power. Forget not that the choice of sin or truth, helplessness or power, is the choice of whether to attack or heal. For healing becomes, comes of power and attack of helplessness. Whom you attack, you cannot want to heal. And whom you would have healed must be the one you chose to be protected from attack. And what is this decision but the choice whether to see him through the body's eyes or let him be revealed to you through vision? How this decision leads to its effects is not your problem, but what you want to see must be your choice. This is a course in cause, not effect. Consider carefully your answer to the last question and you, the last question you left unanswered still, and let your reason tell you that it must be answered and answered and is answered in the other three. And then it will be clear to you that as you look on the effects of sin in any form, all you need to simply ask yourself is this what I would see? Do I want this? This is your one decision. This is the condition for what occurs. It is irrelevant to how it happens, but not to why. 
you have control of this. And if you choose to see a world without an enemy in which you are not helpless, the means to see will be given you. Hang on a second. That that uh, just struck me to my core. Hang on. As you know, I struggle with this work sometimes. I find it really difficult and obtuse and the language archaic. And then every once in a while, there's something in it that's just so freaking profound that it just, it just is so moving. Because this right here, what this is talking about, it's much broader. I mean, in, in this context right here, they have it really narrowed right down. But it's really, this is about all of life, right? In any moment, you have the opportunity to decide what you're going to see in that moment. And, and once you realize this and once you take control of this you'll see a completely different world than the world most people see and we can't create the new world until enough of us can see this new world so i'm going to review this just for a second here Consider carefully your answer to the last question you have left unanswered still and let your reason tell you that it must be answered and is answered in the other three. So let's just go back for a second and review. The other three questions are, do I desire a world I rule instead of one that rules me? Do I desire a world where I am powerful instead of helpless? Do I desire a world in which I have no enemies and cannot sin? Of course, right? The, I mean, we answered yes to all of that, right? Of course we do. And then it will be clear to you that as you look on the effects of sin in any form, all you need do is simply ask yourself, is this what I would see? Do I want this? This is your one decision. This is the one condition for what occurs. It is irrelevant how it happens, but not to why. You have control of this. And if you choose to see a world without an enemy in which you are not helpless, the means to see will be given you. Why is the final question so important? Reason will tell you why. It is the same as the other three, except in time. The others are decisions that can be made and then unmade and made again. But truth is constant and implies a state where vacillations are impossible. You can desire a world you rule that rules you not and change your mind. You can desire to exchange your helplessness for power and lose the same desire as a little glint of sin attracts you. And you can want to see a sinless world and let an enemy tempt you to use the body's eyes and change what you desire. In context, all the questions are the same, for each one asks if you are willing to exchange the world of sin for what the Holy Spirit sees since it is this world of sin, since it is this world of sin, oh, this sentence, for each one asks you if you are willing to exchange the world of sin for what the Holy Spirit sees, since it is this world of sin denies. It's a terrible sentence. I'm not even sure it's correct in the way it's been put together. I think there might be a typo in here. 
Let's go on and see if it straightens itself out. And therefore, those who look on sin are seeing the denial of the real world. This is true. That's a fact. So let's not worry about that last sentence. Uh, and therefore, those who look on sin are seeing the denial of the real world. Yet the last question adds the wish for constancy in your desire to see the real world. And so the desire becomes the only one you have. By answering the final question, yes, you add sincerity to the decisions you have already made to all the rest. And only then have you renounced the option to change your mind again. When it is this you do not want, the rest are wholly answered. Okay, I want to just pause here for a second. We've only got, I think, two paragraphs left to read. But um, I, don't, I don't want this uh, note to slip away from my uh, thoughts. I can understand that people who right now think that we live in a sinful world filled with debauchery and child pornography and sex abuse and all these things, I can imagine that this, this reading might be difficult for you because we're suggesting that you look out at the world and not see sin. But that's, but that's within a different context. It's within a different definition of the world. So within the world of 3D, where there are people being abused and, and, and horrible things happening. You don't look at that and say, oh, that, that's, that's not, that's, that doesn't exist. It exists, but only in the 3D world, only in the 3D realm, which if we will recall from other teachings and this teaching as well is an illusion. It is there for our purpose it, in, in which case, what would its purpose be? Its purpose would be to learn from. Its purpose would be to show us how we need to grow. So it's not that we're looking at sin and going, oh, that's okay. We're not going to worry about that. Do whatever you want. That's not the point here. You see it. And, and you, you recognize it but it means something different to you. It means something completely different. We don't get bogged down in the judgment and the finger pointing and all of that. It's about a higher, a higher purpose, a higher enlightened way. Because once we all achieve that, those things that we think we see as sins won't, won't happen. Those things will stop. Now that's where people will, you're so lost, right? Because people think that the way they're going to make those things stop is by stopping the people from doing them. That isn't what's going to make those things stop. The thing that's going to make those people stop doing what they're doing is they heal. They won't need to do those things anymore because they won't be broken. They won't have those needs because they won't, they, they, they won't be so yearning for love that they interpret whatever those things are, whatever it might be, as a path to love. I hope that made sense. Anyway, let's get back. We've got two more uh, paragraphs to read here. Why do you think you are unsure the others have been answered? Could it be necessary they have been asked so often if they had? Until the last decision was made, the answer is both yes and no. For you have answered yes without perceiving that yes means not no. No one decides against his happiness, but he may do so if he does not see he does it. And if he sees his happiness as ever changing, now this, now that, now an elusive shadow attached to nothing, he does decide against it. 
elusive happiness or happiness in changing form that shifts with time and place is an illusion that has no meaning. Happiness must be constant because it is attained by giving up the wish for the inconstant. Joy cannot be perceived except through constant vision, and constant vision can be given only those who wish for constancy. The power of the Son of God's desire remains the proof that he is wrong who sees himself as helpless. Desire what you want, and you will look on it and think it real. No thought has the power to release or kill, and none can leave the thinker's mind nor leave him unaffected. Well, okay then. So if it's not clear, this last paragraph, elusive happiness or happiness in changing form that shifts with time and place is an illusion that has no meaning. Happiness must be constant. So happiness must be constant because happiness comes from within. And so until you find that place within yourself where you are happy, regardless of what's happening around you, there is a place within you to find where you will be happy, regardless of what's happening around you. That is what this happiness is, is talking about, this constancy. It comes from within. Happiness doesn't have anything to do with how much money you make or where you live or, or uh, what kind of a job you have or anything. Yes, you can be unhappy in your job, but true happiness of self comes first from a peace and a loving of yourself and then a sense of connectedness to things around you, to people, people and animals around you. That's where true happiness comes from. We came into form to be of service. And so I believe that fundamentally, no one can find happiness true internal peaceful happiness until they have achieved that place where they are at some level being of service in their lives. That sounds a little harsh because I think you could think of kids and are they happy and you know kids are still growing though. This, this happiness that we're talking about here is, is the fundamental happiness of your soul. So it does require some inner work. I can, I can share a personal experience of a moment where I truly understood this form of happiness that I think that we're talking about in this chapter. I had uh, just lost my cabin the first cabin that I built in Alaska, I had lost it to a fire and I had lost several pets in the fire as well. And basically what I lost in the fire was everything that I owned in Alaska. I did have other things in storage still at that point in, in Michigan where I'd moved here from, but the bulk of my life was in that cabin and it was, it burned to the ground. And I was, uh, at my, uh, uh, now he's my husband, but at the time he was the man who'd built the cabin and, uh, uh, you know, a, a romantic relationship, definitely. But now I'm homeless, so I'm, I'm pretty much living there because I'm homeless. And I was at the kitchen sink and I, uh, I was washing silverware and dishes and none of them matched, nothing matched. 
and a couple of my cats that had survived the fire were there and and I was just so peacefully happy and it didn't matter it didn't matter that none of the dishes matched I mean and there was a time in my life when I was younger where all of those things seemed to be important right matching dishes matching silverware nice looking stuff all of this you know you move to the last frontier and and you realize that one man's trash is another man's treasure and a lot of things change in your perspective but in that moment I experienced true happiness, even though I had, uh, you know, I, I was also in a state of great loss, but I, I experienced that moment of just understanding that this is what's important, the being together, the, the, the experience of being here, the opportunity to go through experiences and process them and learn from them and, and become a deeper, richer in spirit person to, to, to deepen our capacity for compassion. So thank you for joining me today. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to have had you share this with me. If you have questions or, or need uh, or would like some additional support processing this material, you can feel free to reach out to me, either uh, messaging me through the platform that you found this, or uh, you can text me directly at 907-351-3003. Um, and um, you can call that or text it. And I thank you so much. For, for being here. Until next week, namaste and much love. <laughs>